Okay. Uh, Luke, uh, very little is known about Luke personally. And the only evidence we have that is trustworthy is his own writings, and that is the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. He wrote both of them, and they are should be considered volume one and volume two in the same work. Uh, they are the length they are because they just about fill up the longest papyrus roll that was uh, easily uh, put together. Uh, because if you got much bigger, uh, it became almost impossible to deal with. Now, one of the great problems that you had in the, using papyrus and the way they wrote is that you had a hard time finding a particular place that you wanted to read. I've used this before about this. They did not have any punctuation, number one. They all, <coughs> all the manuscripts until about the 8th century were written in, in full caps. They did not separate between words and they did not use hyphens. They broke the word anywhere they wanted to. They used columns that were about that wide. And they would put however many letters that the scribe could get in. And if they just had one letter of a word, they put it in there and then just came back. Now, some of the manuscripts are what's called boustrophon. They did like this. Let's see now. I'm, I want it to look like you. This is right, this is to your right and left, isn't it? Uh, Boustrophon means turning like an ox. See, and that's the way you plowed with an ox. Uh, you just did, did like that. Now, most people today don't plow that way unless they've got out in the panhandle in the plains country. They do that uh, with their big disc plows and everything. They, you can see them from the air. But uh, people using one mule, they go down and then they take the plow out and step over a little bit and go back. But that's the thing that makes reading the text. I know when I was an undergraduate at ACU and taking second and third year Greek in the summertime at the same time, they were just starting the great uh, collation of all known Greek manuscripts. There's not a Greek manuscript known to the world that hasn't been looked at and compared to a standard text. And I asked the professor of the third year I was taking if they would allow students to do that. And he said, yes, I think they would. He said, would you like to? And I said, yes. And about three or four weeks later, I got in the mail a copy of a eighth century, that's 700s, uh, manuscript of, the, of Acts. And I then sat down with a standard text and compared every letter of that text with the uh, 
marked standard text and marked every difference. And so when I look at the, uh, well, the critical apparatus at the bottom of, of the United Bible Society text where it gives all the alternative readings and everything, I feel a, a sense of accomplishment because I was part of that. Uh, I can't even remember now how that manuscript is, is numbered. It, you know, it's either numbered, lettered or numbered. Uh, you have Aleph. I don't know why they started Aleph using the Hebrew alphabet. And then you have uh, the P designation, which means the papyrus uh, documents and so on. But that's how accurate the text is. We know more about the text of the New Testament and we know it more accurately than we do the text of Shakespeare. Uh, there's more doubt about Shakespeare's text than there is any text in the Bible. And it's as accurate as human beings can make it. <clears throat> and that's as accurate as we're ever going to get. So if we see a, a, a copy of a Greek text, it's always going to be in that no, format? No, I... It be reformatted then. No, I, no, I said that only some of the Greek texts were that way. How do you distinguish? <laughs> <laughs> Looking at them. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, thank goodness mine was not Boustrophon. Mine, mine was uh, left to right. If you really want to get mixed up, get a Hebrew text, which is from right to left. And it, it can uh, confuse you no end. But the, the, he, the Jews were much more accurate in copying their texts than were the Greek scribes because they actually revered the text as the Word of God. And I, when I say Word of God, I mean they thought literally, even though they're prob probably not right that it, that always it represents words given to the writer. Many times it's ideas and things like that, but we're not going to get into that. I just want you to know the background of, of this. And so we start out, chapter one. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events that have been fulfilled among us. Now, there's so many important ideas there. <coughs> Luke is saying that there were many Gospels circulating. We don't have an, a clue as to how many, uh, but many. And that, as I say, we, there's no use speculating on it. We have some fragments of perhaps other Gospels. We also have what are called the Gnostic Gospels, and I have a copy of the Gospel of Thomas, uh, which is in Coptic, and uh, I don't read Coptic, uh, because it uses uh, the Egyptian Demotic alphabet, but it's Greek, and I can, by careful, uh, you know, A equals C or something like that, I, I, I have struggled through some of it. But I prefer my copy because it's got Coptic on the left and English on the right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but also that the idea of fulfilled, we, I think we misunderstand what the New Testament means by fulfilled. 
And the reason we do that is that since the Enlightenment, believers have thought that the New Testament was written to prove that Jesus was divine. And so when we say fulfilled, we mean it's a proof of his di divinity. And that's not what the New Testament writers meant by fulfilled. Because, and I'll tell you why that's important. Because there are many places, and we'll find some in the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus deliberately acts in a way to fulfill. And we think that's cheating. Deep down, that people don't, and there are many people that, that try to explain that away because they think that that's why they, it was, no. The fulfillment meant that God's promises that he made to and through Abraham and the prophets are fulfilled in Christ, not as a proof of his divinity, but as a proof he was the Messiah of the Jews. And he, and he, his deciding to do certain things is not cheating, you know, to prove he was divine. It is to prove to the Jews that he was the Messiah. Did the Jews expect the Messiah to be divine or human? No. Uh. Now, I'm gonna, that's got an asterisk by it, so let me. Uh, the Jews had a multiplicity of expectations. About the only thing that all of the Jew, the various sects of the Jews at the time of Jesus believed is that he would set his people free from Roman domination and that they would take over and rule the world. Now that's, that's the one thing. Now, the Qumran community, for instance, were, they understood the Old Testament scriptures better than a lot of the Jewish scholars of the time did. Because they realized that there were places in the Old Testament where the Messiah suffered, and a few of them even realized that it predicted his death. And so they didn't know what to do with it. So they, they solved it in a very ingenious way. They, had, they believed in two Messiahs. One would come and suffer and die in order that the second one could become the conquering uh, leader of the Jewish people. So uh, when, I, when you asked, Gary, what did the Jews believe, uh, I don't know of any sect that believed uh, that he was divine. Uh, they, they just, because they believed pretty well like the Muslims do today that that there's only when they say one God there cannot be any persons or anything else that it's just one God and by the way that most Muslims believe that Jesus was a prophet of God uh, that's their teaching they they don't follow him uh, much at all but they do well even in the uh, the Quran they, uh, it's, he's mentioned as a prophet of God. But, uh, of course, uh, Muhammad succeeded him and was superior to him as a prophet. Uh, but does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> See, sometimes I know too much. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I would say basically, no, they did not. Yeah. Okay, the, but it's that, I wanted to get that idea of what fulfilled means. Uh, because 
that is a very important idea. And uh, Mike, it's one that uh, has been, come back to the forefront, that, that the fulfillment was that he was the seed. Actually, the Hebrew word zerah, this translated seed, can mean family and probably should be translated family also. Now, don't ask me how a Hebrew word means seed and family. It just does. It's, it's <laughs> just like asking why does an English word mean something. Did you mention anything about this in your introduction to Luke? You know, like, like this well, idea of Gilfil? No, I'm not going to. Okay. Somebody raised their hand back there. No, I was calling. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I just saw a, a motion. Okay. We're going to go a little further. We got four or five minutes. Four minutes. Now, these events were handed down to us by the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Again, there's two very important ideas there. One is the original eyewitnesses. Now, who were they? What? The apostles. Well, the apostles. Mary. What? Mary. Okay. That's what I want you to say there. Evidently, Luke of, is the only one of the gospel writers who actually went to Mary and got her version of the story. The first two chapters of Luke could have come almost out of the Old Testament. The, you'll see the poetry. I, I've indented it so that you can see what, where there's poetry there. On in other places there's poetry. And they are in the same form that the Psalms are. Now, I'm not a good enough poet in either Greek or English to write them poetically. But, so I just make, a, <coughs> make them poetic in form. I've understood also that the kind of Greek or the way that words were expressed were more um, uh, Aramaic than, than uh, Greek. In other words, there are certain terms that were used that Mary would use as an Aramaic basis you know, when Luke was getting this information from her. Well, it, uh, it's debatable whether it's Aramaic or Hebrew. Uh, and I'm not capable of, well, I'm, I'm not interested in, in enough to become capable of making the distinction. I just call it Hebrew and let it go. Uh, so that th there were eyewitnesses, the apostles and individuals, especially it seems to be Mary. Now, it could be that Mary, uh, Zachariah, uh, and Elizabeth were all uh, eyewitnesses that he that he quoted but the thing he is saying here is these things were handed down to us I'm going to go back to the and servants of the word now this is what Peter calls the apostles in Acts 6 when he says it's not fitting that we should leave the service of the word to wait tables. And it's a technical word that means those that handed down a memorized text to others who memorized it. And we'll have to stop right there.